Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, greetings from the city of Doha in Qatar. My name is Dr. Serkan Krayans, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, new generation artificial neural networks. Um, this was the topic of our last uh, IEEE uh, ICIP tutorial. So this was about a three hours event. So within the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be just showing you a glimpse of it and some interesting uh, results that what we can get. Uh, let me introduce you the outline of this talk uh, over the time evolution of uh, artificial neural networks. Well, on the left, uh, you can see the, um, the natural timeline of the major neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons and convolutional neural networks, uh, which is actually tying up to the sole uh, neural model uh, uh, from 1940s. Uh, well, perceptrons are in introduced in 1969, and then we have the multi-layer perceptrons around 80s, and finally, CNNs uh, arises at 1995 and so on. So um, I will start uh, by talking briefly about uh, generalized operational perceptrons, uh, the GOPs, we call them. And then I will then talk about uh, operational neural networks with operational neurons. Then I will introduce you the concept of uh, self-organized ONNs, operational neural networks, within novel neuron model, we call it generative neurons, and I hope you will understand why we call them. Uh, finally, uh, the latest neuron model, the super neurons, if the time permits, and what we are aiming with this uh, new model uh, in the new future. Well, starting from 2015, we developed uh, operational neurons uh, and used them in heterogeneous networks to achieve uh, significantly superior uh, learning performances in various challenging problems. I'm just going to show you a few examples of them. Uh, then we're going to drive the operational neural networks from GOPs in the same way that the uh, convolutional neural networks are derived from multi-layer perceptrons. And then uh, last year, we created the self-organized variant uh, of uh, ONNs. We call them self-organized ONNs or cell phones. And finally, I'll introduce this new super neurons and what we want with them. Our motivation is simple. Um, the conventional neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons, and nowadays what we use, the uh, deep convolutional neural networks, they have only a single linear neuron model. That's why they are homogeneous networks. All neuron is the same as the other. Only thing you are training is the parameters of the neurons. They have localized kernels. That means they have a limited uh, receptor field size. And that is one of the reasons why you go, why you have to go deep, so that to increase the receptor field size with more and more layers. And in short, they do the same thing. They do linear convolution always at the same place since they have localized kernels all the time and because of their homogeneity. Uh, that is why, again, they need to go deep and that is what we want to change. We want to do the right thing, the optimal operational, optimal transformation at the right place. So we're gonna let the kernels be non-localized and at the right time, which means the neurons will be different and that will give you a, a, a high level of heterogeneity. Let's start beginning with the, doing the right thing. Our motto is simple. Our human intelligence is heterogeneous and nonlinear, so it should AI be. And this is a very rough design of the uh, biological neuron. Let's focus what's wrong on lacking on the current uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, the biological neural systems are diverse and heterogeneous meaning that they contain um, different types of neurons. And the fact is the synaptic connections, these connections over the terminal buttons, uh, they vary from a neuron to neuron. But in the artificial neural networks, the same ancient model from 40s and 50s, uh, they use the same model, this linear model, which makes all neural networks homogeneous. Our aim is to change this and make a superior neural model and mimics the uh, biological neurons as best as uh, possible. Mm. In neurological systems, we have several distinct operations with proper weights are created to accomplish a massive diversity and train in time to learn uh, many neural functions. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you what we mean by operational neuron versus compared with the linear neuron model used in multilayer perceptrons and convolutional neural networks. So what is the idea here? Uh, first of all, the linear transformation, uh, which exists in every conventional neural, artificial neural network, including the MLP neuron here, is replaced by the best 
possible linear or nonlinear uh, nodal function together with the pooling function over here. So this uh, linear weighted sum basically will be replaced with some pooling operator, some or any other pooling, as well as this linear function weight multiplication can be replaced by any nonlinear function. The idea here, we're going to find the best nonlinear function to do the transformation to do what? To achieve the best learning performance. So, and these operator sets, the nodal operators, we call them this P size and the pooling operator P and finally the activation operator F. We're going to search the best of them in our operating set library. And we created these gobs around 2015 and with this relaxation, doing the right thing, in other words, right transformation, we managed to solve those challenging problems where uh, MLPs fail, like two spras. If you train an MLP on a two spras with two, three hidden layers and around 100 neurons, he will not learn this problem. We even extend this problem 30 times, make it more complex, and you will get zero accuracy, whereas a GOP can learn it 100%. Or in another one, if you want to regress such a function, this is a Rastrigin function in 2D, an MLP cannot do that. It cannot learn to regress this function in whatsoever. It will give a very bad regression and very big error. Whereas with GOPS, you can practically bring error down to 10 to the minus 5 level. So it learns perfectly well. I will say that you cannot actually compare multi-layer perceptors and GOPS in many problems. One can give you totally 0% and the other can 100%. So what we did is we compared it against more recent variants. They are called extreme learning machines. The green curve here is our GOP. And we tried it on numerous data sets. I'm just showing you the three of them. These are public benchmark data sets. And the GOPs can even beat AMPs in a very wide margin, as you see here. And these are some uh, publications. If you're interested, you're welcome to check them out. Now, from the GOPs, we, we extend this idea and created the ONNs and its recent variant, uh, self-organized neural networks. But let me start with first operational neural networks. You see here is the same, uh, the same differences in convolutional on the left and the operational neuron on the right. Uh, convolutional neuron only has the linear operator. This is the linear weighted sum. You multiply with weights and add them up, which is by definition the convolution. This feature has been uh, derived directly from the multi-layer perceptrons with two restrictions. Um, the limited connectivity, because you are only connecting three by three, and the weight sharing, you are using the same parameters all over the connection. So with the same restrictions over the GOPS operational perceptrons, uh, we can get an operational neuron on the right here, uh, which shares the same restrictions, limited connectivity and weight sharing, but this time, of course, we are free to choose what nodal operator and what pool operator should be. Should be for what? To maximize the learning performance. Um, just like the biological neurons where distinct synaptic connection exists, in this way, we can have distinct nodal operators and pool operators, and whichever works the best for the problem that we are attacking. Once again, the idea is to do the right thing, or in this case, the right transformation for each neuron in the network. Let me show you how good this can work again compared to the uh, regular conventional uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, we have many, many more than a dozen examples, but I have chosen just one of them. So uh, here we trained CNNs and ONNs with uh, two layers and 48 neurons for denoising of such severely corrupted uh, images. And we use the training uh, over a very scarce data set. Only 10% of the data set are used for training to make it even more challenging uh, problem. Uh, for a visual evolution, the figures show randomly selected original, uh, the corrupted image, uh, the, uh, and the target image on the right, whereas the denoising results of the CNN and uh, ONN. I think if you see, uh, even from your screens, that the, the quality difference between the restoration of the uh, ONN denoised image versus the CNN denoised image. Uh, whereas, if you remember that the training is only for over 10%, the ONN can learn quite well and get such a quality image out of you know this messy or highly noised uh, image. On the other hand, the CNN shows severely blurring artifacts, patching artifacts, and in many images of CNN reconstruction, you cannot actually understand 
uh, what is the uh, content in a, in a clear way. And same as on the right side, uh, this is quite interesting to see that even with such scarce training and the very, very compact network architecture, ONS can do a very good job. Once again, I want to bring the focus more on the recent variants, so I'll give you some couple of articles where you can see the uh, rest of the story. Uh, today, what I want to uh, discuss more uh, is on the, uh, the new variant of ONNs. We call them self-organized operational uh, neural networks. And once again, if you remember our motto, doing the right thing at the right place and the right time, we were talking about the right thing, right transformation. Yes, we can have right transformation ONS, but sometimes the right transformation may not be in your operator set library. You are selecting the right transformation from a library, from an existing, pre-existing library. What if it, if it is not there? Or it may not be a well-defined function, so you cannot actually put it right away into the library. Moreover, we, we have still a limited heterogeneity since we are using the same operator set for uh, neurons in a single layer. We have limited diversity because we all can only use those transformation in our operator set library. We are static. Uh, if you use a sinusoid for a nonlinear operator, what if you need a distorted sinusoid? You cannot distort it. They are statically set. The only thing you can change the frequency of the sinusoid. And they are complex and computational demanding, especially if you use uh, nonlinear functions like Gaussian, derivative of Gaussian, Hermitian, etc. So this time, what we're going to do is we're going to change this paradigm and try to make it a customized nonlinear operator. As you see in this illustration, again, the CNN and the ONN, which the sinusoid is the uh, nodal operator set already. Um, but this time we have the self-organized ONN where the functions are here are actually optimized, created or generated during the backpropagation training. Um, Again, operational neuron can have a single selected nonlinear operator to mimic the distinct synaptic connections of a, a biological neuron. But in generative uh, neurons, the nonlinear operator is created, or you can call it optimized, during training to maximize the learning performance. As you might imagine, this is much better than selecting one operator, obviously, because now you can really make the optimal generations or optimal transformations that directly minimize the cost or error function of the network, <coughs> which is equivalent of maximizing the learning performance. And how we do that? Very simply, we are just <coughs> approximating a nonlinear function with cute order Maclaurin series, and we are learning these parameters. These parameters correspond to the derivatives of the, uh, the nonlinear function, and hence, uh, this every nonlinear function has been customized during the training. And just one example to give a deep CNN can denoise this noisy image, additive white Gaussian noise, as this much. As you might see, the edges are blurred, and we have patches, patches effect, and blurring artifacts. Whereas with cell phones, since we are uh, customizing the transformation, we can have almost perfect outcome, very clean edges, and the noise is almost completely suppressed. In IC2021 in Alaska, this is the paper that we have presented. Again, the noisy image, severely noisy image this time with additive white Gaussian noise. The clean version in the second row. This is BM3D. Uh, this is a product of Tampere University and it became the state of the art automatic denoiser for many years, a famous algorithm. And this is only a two layer cell phone. And if you again compare with the state of the art automatic denoiser, you will be able to see that the edges, especially, and the content are nicely recovered, much better than the blurring artifacts of the BM3D is uh, affecting. Uh, again, another uh, application domain, I don't want to talk only for the denoising. This is an active research that we are doing and applying cell phones for reconstruction of the ECG signal. Um, very, these are very recent. I mean, we are doing this as we speak, so there is no paper about it. And they are also unprecedented. I have never seen ECG restoration. There are some denoising papers, but what I mean here is the restoration, meaning that uh, all artifacts like cuts, like fluctuations, like severe noise has to be suppressed by the model that you have. 
Uh, this is an ECG from Holter ECGs. Uh, as you know, these are the uh, a heart patient should carry this in a day or two or a week, and the cardiologist will then analyze the ECG and look for arrhythmia and how often it is, what type of arrhythmia, etc. Problem is, uh, the, this is the natural quality of the ECG because the patient is moving, and that is why it is a challenging problem. Whereas when we apply our algorithm cell phones, reconstruct the signal, you can get this out of this. Another example is here. You can see the severe fluctuations and we can almost get a clinical level, uh, clinical quality ECG. And we can even do this more than one pass. Again, the original ECG signal, very noisy fluctuations and the amplitude now is a problem. Some beats have very small amplitudes. And if, if you make the first pass, it's good. But if you wait the second pass, you have almost noise free uh, amplitudes are fully restored, uh, clean ECG. And final one, again, quite a bad one on the top. And look at what we have uh, on the bottom. So this is, again, quite an uh, interesting application of cell phones. Another, perhaps, is on the X-ray restoration. The same again. You can get X-rays. Sometimes they're in good quality like this, but we can always make them better. And now, this four will tell you uh, problems of x-rays like blurring, first of all, or uh, shading, uh, saturation, or darkish x-rays like that, where you cannot see the details very well, as well as saturation, or whitish x-rays like that. And again, you can create or restore uh, a good quality x-ray out of a, a distorted x-ray. Uh, you can see on the last one, there is a room for improvements. Uh, the, Edges are not that sharp. So what we can do, once again, we can apply two passes and you can get this X-ray from this one. Or you can, we can get this X-ray from that one. Obviously, I'm assuming that as a radiologist or cardiologist, they don't want to analyze this X-ray, but they will be happy to see all the details in such an X-ray. Once again, uh, the original, the first pass and the second pass. And the second pass has giving you all the details, sharp, clean, and the saturation has been suppressed, noise has been removed. Um, yeah, okay, I have one more example. But these are different artifacts, and all in all, one model is able to uh, restore uh, the biomedical signal, no matter what the problem is. And these are really unprecedented and pioneer applications so far. And finally, if I can go with the new neuron model, we call them super generative neurons. And this time I'm gonna talk about not only doing the right thing, but we should do it on the right place and the right time. And basically, since the time is pressing, we are doing the right transformation, but the problem is, are we doing it at the right location? Uh, it, not if you are localizing your kernel locations, what I mean by localization is the kernel locations are usually around the uh, pixel that you are want to create. So this is localized kernel, and that means to create this pixel over here, you have to use only these nine pixels for all connections you made on the previous layer. But what if these pixels also contain relevant information? You are missing them. So what we do is we relax this uh, constraint and we let kernels move. And better than randomly moving, we can even learn how to move them. So this is the idea of super neurons where the kernels are now non-localized, either randomly, or as you see here, we can learn where to move them during backpropagation training. And uh, so they are shifting and finding a good location. And at that location, we are creating the best possible transformation. In other words, uh, we are doing the right transformation at the right place. That is the idea. It is as if optimizing a first uh, uh, 1D function f of t, we can optimize the f versus we are now optimizing f of t minus tau, a shifted version of f, where as well as we can optimize both f and the tau, the shift itself, to maximize our learning performance. And again, if I show you some results, and these are quite interesting, because here you will see a compact network with super neurons, the cell phone with super neurons, only with three layers versus the state of the art with 17 layers. If you look at the PSNR values, 
they are pretty close, almost the same, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dB difference only. So a three-layer network can now compete with a 17-layer deep network. And if I show you some results, the right side is showing the uh, results with the cell phone with the super neurons, again, on the denoising problem. Whereas the CNN and the cell phone outputs are, again, suffering from the noise effects. Again, here, if you can see the background, for instance, is much better with super neurons, as well as when you compare with the deep CNN and the cell phone outputs. But I mean, you can see how severely corrupted the original image is. Same thing here. Uh, if, if you look at the quality of the edges, for instance, you can understand how better uh, a new neuron model can, can, can perform. Uh, last of all, on another denoising problem, but this time it's the real world denoising results. Uh, the, it's not additive white Gaussian noise. And the three layer network, our network, can even surpass 17 layer deep counterparts more than 1 dB. This was very surprising to us. And the first time I'm seeing this, a compact network can beat a deep uh, counterpart. And again, over some colorful images, you can see that the background is much cleaner and the edges are much sharper uh, compared to the uh, deep part. So all in all, I would like to uh, conclude here. I'm out of time. And uh, just want to uh, ask you, if you visit our web page, the rest of the story is there. And uh, thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to hear. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Karanyas. Uh That was very interesting. So uh, any of the questions in the uh, Q&A? I didn't see any. I was typing one of, you know, are there any fears of, um, you know, when you're doing medical data that you're going to correct out a real problem? Has that been an issue? Um, well, the, in the medical data, this is quite new, actually. Just last month, we were getting some results. I can actually share again and okay. uh, sh show you the uh, corresponding slides with that. Um, for instance, this one. So the, a typical halter can is the signal like this. And the doctors have a hard time of understanding which one is the beat and which one is the artifact. So this is, uh, we talk with cardiologists here, and uh, this is most of the time they ignore, that means they're ignoring this kind of arrhythmia, arrhythmic beats over these problematic regions. And these problematic regions can be as high as 40% of the whole uh, signal. But if you can correct it to this with a very compact network, I mean, imagine number of whole type devices used worldwide, and this plugin, this software can be just added to them. And instead of suffering from such a low quality, signal, now doctors can easily assess and evaluate the well-being of the patient. And same thing for the x-rays. I mean, who wants to uh, analyze an x-ray like that, where everything is kind of saturated, you cannot see the details. And if you compare this over this, uh, you can see the uh, value of this uh, new technology. Uh, the good thing, the good news is that this method is actually restoring the, the image, whatever the problem is, whatever the noise level is, whatever the saturation level is, whatever other problems is. So in terms of this angle, it's unprecedented method. I'm not sure if you can read the other, there's another question there, do you see it or should I read it to you? Um, could this be used <laughs> to noise MRI images as well? Yes, of course, we will actually planning to do MRI. MRI is relatively cleaner, much cleaner than X-rays. Uh, we are planning to apply this to uh, echocardiography, which is one of the worst quality ever, and it's so bad. Echo, echo is a very good uh, invention. I mean, it can show you if there is a heart attack or myocardial infarction going on or not. But many times, because it's a very low quality, cardiologists are ignoring uh, echocardiography. But right now, maybe in a week or two, we will get our first results with echo, echocardiography. I hope we can generate quite high quality echocardiography so that they can rely on, I mean, they, they can make much better evaluation and assessment. Okay. So, I don't see any further questions. If, if anyone has questions, I, I believe you should be able to contact Dr. Karanyas. Yes. 
please do so. And if you are bored with using CNNs, I mean, if you are in machine learning business and doing CNN work, I highly encourage you to check it out our web page and let us know. We can help you to do your application much better than it is. We can achieve state of their performance level. Just contact with us. That's it. Okay. Thank you. That was excellent. Okay. Thank so you. I guess I will go on to. So our next two speakers are going to be um, recordings, but um, they should be good nevertheless. And I'll Thank link you. Have a nice day. Excuse me. Well, have a nice day. Yeah. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is Biswa Sengupta, um, doctor, um, and he's at Zebra Technologies, Global Head of Machine Learning, and he's talking about orchestration AI. So you're still able to send him Q, you know, questions, and we'll get them to him. So feel free to still fill in the Q and A, and I'll let it go to the camera. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your invitation to present uh, in this forum. To introduce myself, I am the Global Head for Machine Learning at Zebra Technologies, leading a team that primarily focuses on sequential decision-making problems uh, using methodologies from reinforcement learning, deep learning aided computer vision, and natural language processing, amongst other methods. In the next 15 minutes, I would introduce an initiative at Zebra that looks into multiple technologies on how we can orchestrate a group of agents, be it human or non-human actors like cobots, to pursue tasks like fulfillment, shelf replenishment, inventory management, etc. We name such a continual learning system as orchestration AI. As on the right, uh, as a puppeteer controls multiple marionettes simultaneously, can we build a framework for orchestrating a variety of tasks using machine learning? Consider a scenario where you want to watch a movie. This event comprises of smaller tasks like reading reviews, watching previews, etc. Similarly, consider a task of directing a film that would entail different sub goals of entering a drama school, gathering experience at a movie company, etc. If you are a conductor, you may re recognize the picture on your right showing Wolf Karczek leading a team of 7,500 musicians. Like Wolf, can machine learning algorithms orchestrate the optimal sequence of subtasks required to perform a complicated piece of work? In summary, tasks can be broken down and have different constraints, arrangements, etc. Let's take an example closer to the warehouse and logistic industry. There is no shortage of computer vision, natural language processing, and data science tooling that each have a niche to contribute. For example, suppose you are a warehouse associate and you have the task of replenishing an empty rack. In that case, you may be supported by cameras with embedded neural networks that tell you an empty spot on a particular shelf. A variety of sensors can tell you whether the item that you are loading on your forklift is the right commodity to be offloaded on the loading bay. Similarly, a platoon of robots can take a smaller parcel from your loading bay and autonomously bring it in front of the empty shelf. In the same manner, voice-based assistance using the warehouse management system can indicate to a human whether their help is required for the replenishment. I have described many technologies that work in isolation, just like the thousands of musicians you saw earlier, yet the conductor is missing. The industry needs a solution that can piece together these technologies and develop an 
optimal sequence of tasks that ought to be solved to achieve a pre-specified goal. Enter reinforcement learning that has co constantly been stealing the limelight by beating human contenders in various games, training robots to pick up items with the same type of mastery as a human, driving vehicles autonomously, or even designing games for our entertainment industry. Recently, reinforcement learning has been used to solve deeper problems in protein folding, and the list continues. Let us see if we can use the same framework for task orchestration. Before doing that, let's have a technical primer on reinforcement learning. Let me explain this by using the example of an autonomous vehicle. The vehicle becomes the agent receiving sensory information S of T. This could be information from the cameras, radars, lidars, or ultrasonics. How the vehicle moves around an environment defines an action. This action tells us if we were moving left or right, the pedal pressure applied, etc. The reward is the vehicle's feedback from the environment. Say a positive number indicates that reaching its destination um, is, a, is a good thing, or negative for taking a non-optimal route. Often, it might be better off to sacrifice immediate reward for benefits in future. For example, Stopping to fill gas slows you down, but enables the vehicle to have enough gas to reach its destination. Let's now look at using reinforcement learning for task orchestration in the retail uh, uh, industry. Consider you are a store manager. Would it help you if someone tells you that the weather will change from sunny to rainy, and therefore there would be an influx of people who'd come to your store for umbrellas. Similarly, if we knew a football game was happening closely, customers would drop by to purchase food, drinks, etc. The capability that we call orchestration AI enables you to scramble agents, humans, or non-human agents to perform various tasks in response to a spike in demand. Very much similar to a real life store um, uh, that is running and, and balancing the supply and demand. More specifically, consider the following scenario, where we have a physical space, say a retail store on your left-hand side, such a store, uh, that has been depicted uh, using the animation on the left has a defined layout with shelves, products, etc., to be maneuvered by agents. These agents could be a group of retail associates or they could be robots. The store has a variety of sensors like CCTV cameras, barcode scanners, point of sale, that supply us with current state of affairs of the store. Additionally, the store has pretty static properties like store size, lack locations, and many tasks the associates pursue. For such a scenario, how could we orchestrate the agents or associates to dynamically scramble to meet demand spikes from an incoming deluge of BOPIS or buy online pickup in store orders. Enters orchestration AI that can sense and analyze using structured and unstructured data analysis, computer vision to learn about the number of people in the store or NLP to categorize the types of tasks that frequently appear. What orchestration AI then does is it ingests this information and using machine learning technique of reinforcement learning to figure out who the optimal associates are for an incoming 
uh, queue of task dispatches agents to meet the demand. Very much similar to what a ride hailing application would do, albeit a bit more complicated. Say there are three agents that are working on different tasks. As soon as the BOPIS or the buy online pickup in store order arrives, OAI or orchestration AI comes up with a real time decision within minutes. For example, it could be a decision that Emily should stop working on her replenishment task and move to fulfillment task just to meet the spike in demand. Although we can take such a real-time decision on a sub-second resolution, orchestration AI constrains our decision-making to emit decision every 30 minutes. You may ask, how do we do this? First of all, using cameras and LiDAR sensors, we collect point clouds to build a 3D environment model. Such a model posits the agent with constraints that they have to adhere to. We can then use such information to create a synthetic digital twin, which has two purposes. First, it serves as a visual debugger for the store manager to see what is undergoing in their retail store in real time. The second objective lies in building the digital twin, enabling reinforcement learning algorithms to make decisions. Let us now see what it entails when we talk about analyzing the environment. This relies on time series analysis of the store. And that sort of analysis brings in external predictors like weather to build uh, predictive supply and demand models. Secondly, it uses computer vision to understand the scene, where the shelves are, how many visitors are walking into the store, whether somebody is shoplifting, etc. The task are analyzed using natural language processing to build semantic search engines and knowledge graphs out of the free flowing text that store managers often have in Excel sheets or under some task execution system. Thus time series analysis, computer vision and NLP or natural language processing help us to sense and analyze the environment. However, it doesn't allow us to act. For action, the task of machine learning algorithm is to distribute the task by keeping an eye on the demand, the retail store associates skill set, their working hour, compliance requirements, etc. Like a human manager, it has to distribute and disengage associates from their task to finish as many tasks as possible in a given unit of time. Without going much in the detailed construction of the reinforcement learning algorithm, we show the RL or the reinforcement learning algorithm can dynamically solve such scheduling tasks under a hierarchical and a decentralized flavor. In the hierarchical setting, task distribution to associates and their motion towards the specified location in the store are separate. Motion planning becomes increasingly crucial where the workforce comprises a mixed cohort of human associates as well as robots. Similarly, both phases have to be learned simultaneously in the fully decentralized setting, making the decision-making problem far more difficult as shown on the graph on the right. We have demonstrated that we can develop a smarter task ex execution in engine 
based on bleeding edge reinforcement learning algorithms by structuring our task hierarchically. I hope I have provided you with a glimpse of what orchestration AI offers. The long-term vision is to concentrate on the act part of sense, analyze, and act mantra. Starting from the bottom, Zebra has a variety of sensors, be it handheld devices, robots, cameras, etc. These sensors enable us to build a good enough interpretation of physical spaces like a warehouse or a retail store. Once this data is ingested, it allows us to use bleeding edge machine learning, such as computer vision, natural language processing, time series models, or reinforcement learning to sense, analyze, and make real-time decisions. The use cases can be in task execution, as we just saw, supply chain orchestration, edge orchestration, and building the next generation of warehouse execution system that can be proactive instead of being reactive. In summary, as a technologist, I'm excited with the opportunity of intersecting Zebra's current hardware-focused offerings with next-generation machine learning-based software technologies to provide an end-to-end -end solution that would be hard to ignore for the wider industry. With that, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sangupra, Gupta. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you can still put them in Q&A and we'll get them to Dr. Sangupta as soon as possible, um, immediately after this show. Okay, so uh, today we have Dr. Icho Wang, and he's from uh, Peking, professor at Peking University, speaking about the complexity of active visual tracking. Good morning. My name is Yi Zhou Wang from Computer Science Department of Peking University. Today, I will introduce two models of active visual tracking. This is the outline of my talk. The goal of an active visual tracker is to follow a target object by autonomously controlling the motion system of a tracker given its visual observations. The application includes mobile robots, photography drones, autonomous driving, and video surveillance. Active visual tracking can be very challenging, especially when the target is moving in a very complex environment. Where the structure of the environment can be very complex and the movement of the target can be fast and constantly changing. There may exist occlusions and many distractors. The lighting conditions may vary along the movement of the target. Therefore, it can be really hard to close, closely follow a fast-moving object. In addition, when there are multiple trackers, their efficient collaboration strategy could be another challenging issue to consider about. Traditional active tracker, which is shown to the left of the slide, usually is composed of two modules. One is a, a passive tracker, which takes an image sequence as input and detects the target in each of the video frame. The other component is a camera motion controller, which outputs the action of the camera according to the position of the target in each of the video frame so that it, it keeps the target as close to the center of its view as possible and keeps the size of the target about the same, which means that it keeps about the same distance to the target. The limitation of the 
traditional method include that the data collection can be hard. As shown in the previous slide, we can see that the human tracker works so hard to follow the target. Second, training an accurate passive tracker in a supervised way is costly. Because manually annotating the target in each video frame is labor intensive. And if the target is changed, it may need to train a new target detector. Thirdly, it is difficult to tune the two components jointly so as to follow the target nicely due to the large joint parameter space. To alleviate the above problems, we propose an end-to-end -end active viral tracking model, which is shown to the right side of the slide. It takes an image sequence as input and learns its hidden representation, then directly maps it to the camera mo motion. The learning is realized by reinforcement learning. Compared to the traditional two-step method, the new one does not require to bounding box the target. In other words, it needs not to train a target detector specifically, whereas the learned hidden representation is more sensitive to the motion of the target rather than being confused by the appearance variation of the target. I will show this in later slides. As a result, the learned tracker can be easily generalized to tracking different targets in various environments. In addition, the proposed model is more compact compared to the traditional ones. However, if the tracker is trained in real physical world with trial and error, like the man running the previous slide, it will be very costly and inefficient. Therefore, we build a near realistic virtual environment, namely Unreal CV, for agents to practice their learning autonomously. From such environment, we can obtain rich high fidelity visual observations, both indoor and outdoor, and accurate ground truths since they are rendering with graphics engine. Real-time interactions can be also realized. We connect them with the OpenAI Gym interface so that we can monitor the learning states and the parameters during the IR learning. This project has been open sourced at unrealcv.org. We argue that the richness of the environment determines the capacity of intelligence. To train robust active trackers, we use environment augmentation technology to generate a large number of virtual environments by randomizing the environmental factors. For example, the number of objects in the scene, their shape and appearance, the layout of the scene, even the dynamics of the scene, etc. Next, we introduce two models of active visual tracking. One is for one target and one tracker. The other is for one target, one tracker, and several distractors. First, let's see the one versus one model. We all know that introducing the adversarial mechanism to learning is able to induce robust learners. In this work, we propose to employ a game mechanism between the target and the tracker and call it asymmetric dualing mechanism, in which the tracker manages to follow the target, whereas the target tries to escape from the tracker. Through this game, both the target and the tracker learn behavioral policies from scratch. Their ability continue to grow simultaneously with adversarial learning, as if they both take an automatic, easy to hard training curriculum, and finally, learn robust policies in different environments without overfitting to certain superior features. For the tracker, as shown to the left of the slide, the input is its view. It passes through a convolutional neural network followed by an RSTM to fuse historical frames. Then an actor critique module evaluates and outputs its action. For the target, 
the input includes not only its own view, but also the tracker's view and the tracker's action. Compared to the tracker, the target has more information to make decisions, so it is smarter than the tracker. It serves as the engine to drive the two-party learning. This is the reason we call it the asymmetric duality. But finally, the learning will converge and result in a more competent tracker compared to the symmetric dualing game. This slide shows the reinforced learning rewards of the two parties. Intuitively, the tracker will obtain a high reward if it can lock the target in the center of its view and keep a constant distance from it. The target reward is a bit more complex. It has two zones, as shown in the bottom figure. The yellow zone is the zero-sum zone, which is an intuitive meaning that the tracker's gain is the target's loss. The green surrounding zone is not zero-sum zone. It is used at the beginning of the training, as we observe that the target is very easy to lose the tracker at the beginning of the co-learning. We create this non-zero-sum zone to penalize if the target quickly escapes from the tracker so as to ensure that the learning can move forward. Now let's see some results. Based on this game mechanism, we have observed an interesting phenomena during the learning process. The target is more inclined to run to an area where the background is close to its own texture, using this camouflage effect to confuse the tracker. After the tracker was constantly stumped, it eventually learned to adapt to these situations. Further, we consider applying this adversarial mechanism to more complex scenarios, adding a large number of obstacles to the environment. Here we conduct the training in two steps. The first step is to learn basic tracking skills using the hybrid zero-sum reward function just introduced in an environment with no obstacles. Then add obstacles to the environment and at the same time restore the game to the zero-sum game, thereby encouraging the target to use the obstacles and get disappeared from the tracker's view. From these quantitative results, Compared with the baseline methods, our method has clearly improved the training efficiency and effectiveness. We have verified the ability of the tracker to migrate to five very different near realistic scenes of both indoor and outdoor. There are very challenging situations such as snowflakes, halo, obstacle occlusion, drastic changes in lighting, season, or weather, appearance of targets, and so on. From the end-to-end -end model, the biggest problem is the poor interpretability of the model. Therefore, we use TSNE to cluster the hidden state of the tracker's model. It can be seen that when the target position is the same, the appearance is different. The target's hidden reputation distance is very close. But when the position changes, the representation distance will gradually change. That is, the model learns the feature representation that is robust to the appearance of the target and sensitive to the spatial movement. This slide shows a video clip of transferring a tracker's model to a real-world tracking application. The video is pre-shot from the public VOT dataset. The red dot signifies where the camera should turn in order to keep the target in the center of its view, given the current situation. For example, now we lost the, the target and we should turn right to get it back to the center. Now lost it again and turn left to get it back.
And we can see that most of the camera actions are predicted correctly in time. This video shows that we transfer the learned tracking model to a real robot and without doing any adaptation tuning to the model. It still follows the target well. This further manifests the generalization ability of the method. Next, I will briefly introduce the second model. It's known that even the state-of-the-art trackers can easily be fooled by distractors, as shown here. For example, in the soccer video, the camera was supposedly to follow the football, but always be pulled back, shooting the bolt head of the main charge. To alleviate the distraction problem, we propose a mixed, cooperative, competitive, multi-agent game mechanism, where a target and the multiple distractors form a collaborative team to play against a tracker and make it fail to follow. We design a reward structure to attribute the contribution or rewards for each distractor according to its distance from the center of the tracker's view. In other words, the distractor gets a high reward if it takes the center position of the tracker's view. To learn policies in this multi-agent game, we introduce a cross-model teacher-student learning. It is a two-step learning strategy. At the first step, we train meta-policies where reinforced learning in a self-play manner in a very simplified environment using grounded state as input. A grounded state is just the spatial location of an agent in the environment without appearance. Then imitation learning is employed to efficiently impart knowledge learned by the meta policies to the active view tracker in the near realistic environment. The imitation learning is to minimize the callback labeler divergence between the distribution of the teacher's policy and the student's one. The teacher can help the visual tracker avoid numerous trial and error explorations. Through the learning in our game setting, various distracting behaviors naturally emerge. In different learning phases, the meta policies are of different level of difficulties constructing a multi-agent curriculum for the student learning. We can see that the frequency of the distractor appearance is increased during the learning, as shown by the yellow curve in the figure. Meanwhile, the success rate of the baseline visual trackers decreased drastically, shown by the blue and the green curves. In contrast, as the yellow curve shows, the performance of our model is not affected too much. In this experiment, the tracker is trained in a room with environment augmentation. Then we evaluate it in another room with different number of distractors. From the curves, we can see that the performance of both our tracker and the baselines degrades as the number of distractors increases. We also show that our tracker has good transferability in unseen environments, such as the urban city and the parking lot. Besides the two models I just introduced, we also studied two other tracking settings, that is N versus 1 and N versus M, which were published in the conference of AAAI 2020 and the New Rifts 2020. Due to the time limit, I cannot introduce them here. If you are interested in them, please find them on my web page. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. And uh, if anyone has questions, it would be really great and we'll get them directly to him. And it looks like there's at least one.
So uh, thank you. That's the end of this session. We have a 15 minute break.